Thank you, folks. It is great to be here in Columbus, Ohio. You know, while you're standing, I want to share a vision I have with you. I see a day not far from now where every major media outlet, secular media, television, magazine, newspaper, and radio broadcast this headline, Christians, the healthiest people in the world. Amen? <laughs> Believers in Jesus with less cancer, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, childhood conditions, and children of the Most High God with vibrant energy into old age, causing a lost and dying world to be jealous of what we have and want to know more about the God we serve. Amen? I believe it can happen. You may be seated. You know, as the elder mentioned, several years ago, in fact, 13, I had lost what I took for granted most of my life, and that was my health. You know, we have this saying in America, you don't know what you've got until it's gone, and I hate that saying, but as a young teenager, I took my health for granted, but then I lost it. I was on fire for God in college, completely healthy, and it seemed like overnight that I started to experience symptoms of illness. I would eventually be diagnosed with 18 incurable illnesses at the age of 19. I had Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory disease of the digestive tract, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue syndrome, extreme anemia. I had all kinds of infections, and I was wheelchair bound 104 pounds, and I'm just over six feet tall. I was hospitalized, and I remember thinking to myself, Lord, you told me that you have plans for my life, plans to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me a future and a hope. But here I am lying in a hospital bed with a guy in a lab coat telling me your disease is incurable, you'll need medication, surgery, you may be able to have children, putting all these limitations on my life. And then he said that thing we all love to hear, but don't worry, science is working on advancements for people like you. I said, people like me? I said, I'm an overcomer. I'm a child of God. But now I'm at the mercy of medicine. You know, I eventually <laughs> gave in to the fact that I was really sick. At first, I thought, well, I'm going to go back to college the next week, the next month. But days turned into weeks and months. And about a year into my illness, after visiting 70 medical experts trying conventional medicine, and it failed. Lots of medications, trying alternative medicine, natural cures, and they failed. I was at my lowest point. I came out of the hospital at 111 pounds. I had beefed up from some IVs. Having almost died when they could not get any blood return, my heart rate was over 250, and from the knee down, I was blue and my nail beds were purple because I had zero iron in my blood. And I was home one day, and my friends and family would often want to come to visit, but I looked repulsive and didn't want them to come. So a friend of mine came without me inviting her, and she showed up, and she wanted to see me. And she asked if there was anything she could do for me, and I said, I'd, I'd like it if you could read my Bible to me. My eyes aren't working very well anymore. And she read a verse that day that I'd read a hundred times, maybe a thousand, memorized in three different translations, but God spoke it a new way to me, and it became my life scripture. And it's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I'm sure you know it well. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or assurance of things not seen. Now, I was ready to turn the page, but God said, go back. And I said, but Lord, I have faith. In fact, I can quote this verse for you in three translations. Lord, I have faith. In fact, I have so much faith that if you heal me, I'll go share this message with my home church, and they can take my name off their prayer request list and everything. Lord, if you make me well, I'll go back to the college ministry I served in, and I'll tell everybody what you've done. Lord, if you give me my old life back, I'll spend the rest of it telling the world about you. Well, it seems as if God said the following right after that, whoop de doo uh, in the ancient Hebrew, of course. <laughs> because what he said to me is, he said, 
son, faith is not hindsight. Faith is proclaiming the mountaintop when you're lying face down naked in the valley. And I said, whoa. And I went on to read that faith comes by hearing the word of God, which I had. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And here is the toughest challenge of all. Faith without action or works is dead, anemic, non-existent. Now, what could I do? I was 100 plus pounds deathly ill, living in the home that my parents raised me in, being taken care of by an infant, medically withdrawn from college, no money. In fact, my parents spent well over $100,000 on natural treatments plus medical insurance. My friends were few and far between at the time. What could I give? It was then that the Lord encouraged me to do the second most important thing I've ever done in my life after accepting him as my Lord and Savior. Because I stood up in front of the closet in my parents' home, and I said, Mom, I want you to take my picture today. She said, take your picture. I, I don't want to take your picture. She said, it breaks my heart to look at you. Why do you insist? And I said, Mom, you need to take my picture. She said, Jordan, can't we wait till you're well? And I said, Mom, you need to take this picture today because the world's not going to believe what God's about to do in my life. And I believe we have a copy of that photograph up for you on the screens. Actually, that's just the side of my head <laughs> currently. We will have that photograph up on the screen. But before it comes to build anticipation, I want to let you know something. Because this is the verse that came to mind when I looked in the mirror and saw that, her still not up there, saw that horrific sight. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31 says that God uses the weak things of the world, the despised things, to shame the strong. Don't have pick. Okay. Um, you're going to get to see it another time. I was very ill, very thin, and emaciated. But during that time, I would go out in public, and there would be, you know, shock or disdain. People would walk away from me, not be drawn towards me. So I know what it's like to feel that way. But God uses the weak things, the despised things, to shame the strong. So if your before picture today of your bank account shows you're this close to losing everything, if your marriage is hanging by a thread, if your kids that you've raised according to God are out there doing who knows what with God knows who, if your health has been given such a death sentence by a man in a white coat saying you've got a few months to live, I want to encourage you that God specializes in those valleys when we're lying face down naked. And in my life, that profession of faith that I made, getting that photograph taken, which, by the way, is my most prized possession. I promise you, you'll get to see it someday. The test, someone's holding up my book, and there's a picture on it. Everyone can't see that. I can barely see it, but especially with, the, with how thin I was. But I'm reminded that God uses the weak things to shame the strong. You know, my profession of faith was all that I could muster. Maybe half the size of a mustard seed, but I do know this, that God honored it. He didn't honor it the next day, the next week, or the next month. It wasn't instantaneous, but it was miraculous nonetheless. Because I believe that principles can trump miracles. But it didn't happen the next day, the next week, the next month, or even a year from then. Over a year from that date, I met a man by telephone who told me that he knew how I could get well. Now, I had already visited 69 other medical experts, the best of the best, but this man had an answer, and I wasn't going to turn it down because I was about to get a dangerous surgery that I didn't want. I'm one of those crazy people who believe all your body parts belong inside your body, not on the operating room table. So I was on the phone with this man, and he said, Jordan, I know how you can get well. He said, you need to follow the health plan of the Bible. I said, the what of the what? I said, sir, I don't mean any disrespect, but I read the Bible every day, and I don't see anything about push-ups and carrot juice. But he said, Jordan, you're looking at it all wrong. The Bible's not some dusty old spiritual book you bring out of your shelf once a week. He said, it's a life manual. It's the owner's manual for your life. And I said, this makes sense. Wait a minute. I had faith that God could heal me. 
I know that God doesn't waste pain. I knew that if I could just help one person overcome disease or never get sick, this would have all been worth it. But instead of all those crazy treatments that I undertook, what if God wants to heal me with something that is completely reproducible, that anybody, anywhere could follow and only he could gain the glory? I didn't have much left, and I certainly didn't have much to lose. And I gave my life 40 days, whether I had it or not, I wasn't sure, to following God's plan. I devoured the Word of God. I looked into my concordance and found every verse that had to do with health, healing, food, and I found a lot. And it all started with this promise I want to read to you coming out of Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. You can turn with me quickly if you have your Bibles. God speaking through Moses to the entire body of Israel, and he says, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians or the rest of the world. I will put none of the diseases on you that I have put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that heals you. Amazing. I thought, well, I want to learn more about who Egypt was and who Israel was at the time. So I studied a little bit about history, and I found that the Egyptians of that day had the most money, the greatest technology, the greatest culture in the world. They were the envy of many nations. The Israelites, however, were this small group of people who worshipped an invisible God, which was a total joke to the rest of the world, because in Egypt they had a God per family. They worshipped an invisible God. They looked differently. They acted differently. They were distinct. But they had a couple of interesting attributes. They were healthy. They had wisdom. People converted to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to have these things. The things money and technology couldn't buy, but Egypt had the best culturally, financially, medically. But thanks to archaeological evidence, we can tell that their health was pretty bad. Diseases resembling heart disease, cancer, osteoporosis, and arthritis. Imagine, they had it all the most advanced nation in the world with some of the worst health. Does this sound at all familiar to you? Could it be that we in America and in the church are accepting the health curses of Egypt instead of the health promises of God? Well, I was convinced, and that scripture not only convinced me to follow God's plan for 40 days, but years later it spoke something important to me. Because when we hear healing, how God heals, we think of one of two things. He's going to use a doctor, or he's going to use a man or woman of God to pray for us, and we'll be healed. Now, what God said 3,000, 3,500 years ago was that his method of healing is if you hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God, do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and obey all his statutes, I won't let you get sick, for I'm the Lord that heals you. Could it be that for thousands of years, our definition of healing is a little bit backwards? Could it be that tonight, as you leave here and someone says, how is church? You're going to say you got healed, and they're going to say, I didn't think you were sick, and you said, you're darn right, I wasn't sick, and I'm never going to get sick, because God promises me abundant health. That's his promise. So I went ahead and gave this 40-day program a try, and believe me, God worked a miracle. Because God did what those 70 doctors couldn't. What man said was incurable, God fixed with a small little help from me following his principles. And I got well. Took two years of failure and 40 days of God's blessing. But when I got well, I learned something interesting. Now, two years of my illness, if you would have asked me any day of the week, Jordan, what can I pray for you? I want my health back. I want my health back. I want my health back. But when God healed me, I realized that my healing was not the miracle I was after. Believe it or not, my wonderful wife and now three children was not the miracle I was after. Now, mind you, I was deathly ill in a hospital bed about to die, wondering why I would never get a chance to fall in love and be married at the age of 19. God gave me that, and it's a miracle, but it wasn't the miracle he had for me. The fact that I have a great team of people that help hold me up to do what I'm called to do is a miracle, but it's not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle of my life happened 10 minutes ago, will happen tomorrow, happened yesterday, 
and it is the chance to live out God's purpose, passion, and mission for my life, which is to see the health of his people transformed one life at a time. And my prayer tonight is that here at World Harvest Church, it starts with you, and it starts with you, and you in the back, because I believe God wants to work a miracle in your life and give you something that without which you will never be effective for his kingdom. I want to repeat that. Without which you will be never effective for his kingdom. You know, we have great messages of lifestyle principles in churches. Finally, marriage and family is part of our teaching from the pulpit. For years, they said, leave it to the psychologists. Finally, financial stewardship is being taught from the pulpit. For years, it was leave it to the experts. But folks, I got to tell you, as important as a great marriage is, as important as raising wonderful, God-honoring kids is, as important as financial stewardship is, you can't be a good husband or wife, you can't be a good father or mother, and you can't balance your checkbook if you're dead. And you certainly can't do very much if you're seriously ill. You know, God put his spirit in our body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians. And we just kind of glaze by that verse, but we don't realize that God says if we defile this temple, he'll destroy us, for this temple is holy, and you are this temple. The same temple that God told Moses, the tabernacle, to build, Solomon, the temple, with exquisite detail on the fact that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies with a string around his ankle because he would die if he did the littlest thing wrong. We are the temple, and we give no thought to destroying it day by day with our decisions. You know, I know what you're thinking. When you come to church and get saved, man, you have to give up a lot. You can't smoke, drink, curse. You can't do this. You can't go there. You can't watch that. Don't take away my food. I mean, come on, we celebrate. Hey, come to the early service. We've got these kind of powdered imitation eggs with all the bacon you can eat and donuts for dessert. And come to the youth event. We've got miles of sundaes, ice cream, hot dogs, you name it. You know, folks, the reason Christianity is not the fastest growing religion today, and by the way, it's not, not by a long shot, is because the world doesn't care how much you pray. They care how you live. They want to know how good your marriage is, how good your children are. They want to know your financial situation, your stress level, and they want to see your health. But guess what? The church has done a horrible job in marriage because we're just as divorced and just have as many problems as the world. Raising kids, our kids are doing just as many things wrong as any other, and our finances, we're just as broke and in debt as anybody. But health, folks, we're not the same. We're worse, and I'm tired of it, and I hope you are too. You know, I got well for a reason, and it might be just for you tonight. As soon as I got well, I wanted to tell the world about what God did in my life, and I thought they all wanted to hear how to get well the Bible's way, and the world wasn't ready, so I did the next best thing. I moved back home and started working at a local health food store stocking beans and organic chips. You know, I was making $4.50 an hour, but I had an amazing opportunity day after day to have people walk in this health food store and ask one of my associates how they could help their condition of this, or my child has that, my husband has that. I'd bounce up out of my uh, stock boy position, and I would say, hey, have you ever thought about taking this or using that or reading this? And I saw amazing things happen. People would come back week after week, and they'd say, Jordan... I don't know if you remember me, but I'm the lady that had this. My kids were suffering from that, and now I'm well. Now, I want to explain something to you. I wasn't a doctor. I wasn't famous. I hadn't written any books. I wasn't a health expert. I was just one thing, a minimum wage worker willing to share truth that I had lived. God rescued me from that stock boy position about a year later, and I started an organization called Garden of Life. Now, I started it in my parents' friend's garage. That's what you do when you can't afford your own garage. <laughs> and the organization had a mission to empower extraordinary health. I ended up, a few years later, writing my first book. Somebody said, Jordan, you've got to write your story in a book. And I said, sure, I'll, let's do it. Eventually, I did. And the first book I wrote was called Patient, Heal Thyself. 
And it had a picture of me on the front cover, my before picture and my after. And people would read the book, and they didn't see some thin guy who was sick got well. I believe they saw themselves. They saw their own issues. They saw hope. You know, I believe as I've traveled the world these last few years that people are deficient in all kinds of nutrients. I'll talk about that tonight. They're deficient in certain foods, but they're more deficient in hope. And I want you to receive hope today that whatever health challenge you're facing or what may lie ahead, God is faithful to deliver you even before you get sick. And what a great God we serve. So I started Garden of Life. And the organization grew, and then we founded the Biblical Health Institute, which is an online training institute. Our vision is to see biblical health coaches in every church. Imagine if you've got a friend, say they're not a believer, and they're outside the church, they've got cancer, and you tell them, hey, I'm praying for you. Now, if they don't know the Lord, they kind of think your thoughts are with them, you know, whatever, in a mystical kind of way. But imagine if you could say, hey, you know what, I am praying for you, and our church has biblical health coaches that can help you deal with the side effects of chemo, deal with the emotional issues of being told you've got six months to live by an authority figure. By the way, I think that should be outlawed, and imprisonment should be given to someone who tells anyone when they're going to die. And then you're offering someone a, a real service. You know, Jesus healed and he fed people. There was no Jerusalem Post back then, no CNN World Nightly News. Jesus did tangible things in people's lives. That's how he became so well known. And I want to talk to you tonight how in your own family and in your sphere of influence, you can bring this message of health and hope to them. So we founded the Biblical Health Institute and we began ministering in churches and both organizations grew. And because of my illness, People that were sick were drawn to the message. Digestive illnesses, skin disorders, immune system challenges, cancer, autism, Alzheimer's. That's who I worked with. That's who I wrote books for. But about a year and a half ago, I saw some statistics that really troubled me. And they said that if things don't change in America by the year 2015, just seven years from now, 75% of American adults will be overweight. 85% of American adult minorities will be overweight. And the statistic that broke my heart, if things don't change, one out of three children who were born after the year 2000, that's eight years old and younger, will develop type 2 diabetes. Now that's a bad disease. We know about insulin shots. We know that your kidneys can go and your eyes. We know that you can look older. But did you know that children who are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes have a 15 to 27 year shortened lifespan? Do you think that our future isn't being stolen from us? It is. John 10.10 says, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And just in case you were wondering, he's not going to the local club. He's not going to the dog track. He's coming here. Because he thinks if he can steal, kill, and destroy your health, that he can blot out eternity, names that are going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because if God called you to reach someone at 76 and you die at 62, that's a problem. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But are we leaving our doors wide open or at the least unlocked. I love the second part of that verse, but I, Jesus, came that you may have life more abundantly, overflowing to the max, to the envy of those that don't know him. You know, when I read these statistics, I decided to do something about it. For the first time, I was going to create a program to deal with overweight, obesity, diabetes, and we developed it over a year ago. It's called Perfect Weight. And it's a great program because it allows you to eat, drink, snack, supplement, cleanse, even think for your perfect weight. Not the weight of your sister, not the swimsuit model, not the GQ cover guy, but your perfect weight. It made sense. Every other diet's been written under the sun, but everybody has a perfect weight that they'll be healthy if they reach. We want to get you there. We don't want to tell you what it is. We just want to get you there. But I didn't just want to write the book for individuals. So we decided to get the nation involved. It's Perfect Weight America, because Lord knows we need it. So we have this book, and it's a really good book. 
It has a bunch of different individual customized programs for you to follow that you can succeed at for the first time maybe. But the book didn't seem like enough, so we decided to create an online wellness coach. You may not know this about yourself, but people don't really do what's expected, they do what's inspected. So we created an online wellness tool that will allow you to not only get a daily meal plan, which you can change if you don't like certain foods, a daily exercise prescription, cleansing information, you can post your before photo on your My Perfect Weight page, you can journal because it's important to keep track of things. We'll even tell you how you're doing relative to your program. And I'll even send you text messages if you let me. Could you imagine waking up in the morning to a beep on your phone saying, hey, did you work out yet? Jordan. At lunch, think about it this way. You're driving through a drive through and they say, do you want fries with that? And all of a sudden, a beep on your phone, the answer is no, Jordan. <laughs> For dinner, did you eat broccoli? Jordan. You know, that's why God created delete buttons on phones. But either way, we'll help you out if you let us. But we wanted to go further. We started publishing a magazine on how to reach your perfect weight, telling great stories of people that have overcome obesity and other issues. But it still didn't seem like enough. We launched a TV program on many Christian networks where you're going to see what's happening in the Perfect Weight America campaign. But probably the best and craziest idea any of us had was that we needed to get where people were, get into schools, get into churches, get into health food stores and gyms, and we decided to take this on the road. So for 15 and a half weeks, I have been in a red, white, and blue bus, 45 feet that says Perfect Weight America, traveling across this nation. We started in San Diego, we went to Los Angeles, we went to Northern California, Seattle, Salt Lake City, then we went to Phoenix and Glendale, Arizona, Colorado Springs and Boulder, Denver. Then we went to Oklahoma, Tulsa and Oklahoma City, Austin, Houston, Baton Rouge. Then Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, Illinois, back to Anaheim, California. I'm a little geographically challenged, as you can tell. And then we went to upstate New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And guess what? Right now we're supposed to be in Florida, but I got an invitation that I just couldn't refuse because someone here needed this message right here in Columbus, Ohio. Now, folks, I'm in a 45-foot red, white, and blue bus, and it's 2008. Coincidence? Maybe. Now, I'm campaigning, but I don't want your vote. I don't want a single campaign dollar. I have not participated or will in a single caucus because, frankly, I still have no idea what that means. <laughs> but I am going to ask you to make a decision to choose life. You see, I believe each and every one of us wake up with only two choices every morning. We either choose life or we choose death. There's not this middle non-existency, this, you know, I'm just going to float through. No. Whether it's finances, relationships, or health, you're either living or you're dying. And I want to share with you principles today, right now, how you can change your diet, change your life, and change your world. That's what Perfect Weight America is about. But before I do, I want to let you know that everybody here, typically we love to give books away and do all kinds of things, but you see I was invited to come here Friday, so I wasn't able to pull that together. But just for you folks, we, this online wellness tool that's normally a $240 value, if you go to perfectweightamerica.com, that's perfectweightamerica.com, type in the letters PWA, which stands for Perfect Weight America, you will get a free year subscription because I want you to get this information. I can't possibly share it all tonight, and we need you to be a healthy, well-equipped army for the Lord. But because Pastor Parsley wanted me to share some practical information, I'm going to give you that in 11 simple but profound principles. But before we do, there's two reasons diets fail. Actually, three. I'm going to tell you two right now. The first of which is, well, you don't follow them. We, we just don't really go on programs. And now we know there's a program. We can recognize the guy who wrote the book. We might even own the book. Our sister might have been on the diet, and we could have paid the admission fee. But did you really follow it? Did you stick with it? You know, it's funny, occasionally I'm recognized in public, and very occasionally, let me tell you, airplane, grocery store, health food store, and here's how it usually goes. Hey, you're the guy that wrote that book. I read your book. 
And I say, really, what's your favorite chapter? Oh, well, I skimmed your book. Really? What's your favorite part? Uh, I have your book. Really? What color's the cover? Hey, did you write a book? I mean, come on, folks. We, we kind of tiptoe around that. You know, it's funny. I was home a few weeks ago. I get home about a day or two a week, and it breaks my heart now that I have three children. I'll tell you about that later. But I know that I'm doing God's work. And I was home, and my three children were outside. We were all taking a walk. My oldest son, who's three, took off in his big wheel down the hill. And I thought a car stopped in front of him. But they just stopped, fortunately. And I walked out, and this woman's looking at me kind of funny. And, and she says, hey, you look just like the guy that wrote that health book. What's his name? And I said, Jordan Rubin. She says, yeah, that's it. You must get that a lot. And she pulled away. <laughs> you see, people kind of think they've been on a diet. She probably thinks she's already been on the program. But folks, we don't go on the program. The second reason diets fail is because people come up with all these objections. Like, I don't want to go on a diet. I want to eat whatever there is to eat. I just want to do things in moderation. Have any of you ever said that statement, we make all things in moderation? Can I ask you please never to say it again? You know why? Because it's kind of silly. I could tell you a thousand things right now in moderation that'll kill you, and a thousand more that are not nearly enough, like hugs and kisses and compliments and ladies' roses and gentlemen, you know, athletic competition. But think about it. You think you just want to eat whatever you want. So you go into a grocery store, and there's 29,000 items 29,000. You're not going up and down the aisle, folks, and buying everything. Research shows that you buy the same 30 to 50 items each and every week. Think about it. If I follow you in your shopping trip once a week, once a month, every year, you're buying the same bread, the same meat, the same eggs, the same dairy products, the same cookies, crackers, chips. You're buying the same gum, mint, and candy. You may even buy the same magazine. You do buy the same fruits, and you buy the same vegetables, which are french fries and ketchup, according to research. You're buying the same 30 to 50 items every week. So here's what I tell people when they say they don't want to go on a diet. And here's what I want you to tell people when they say they don't want to go on a diet. And in fact, turn to the person next to you and say this. You're already on a diet. Yours just stinks. I mean, am I right? Or, or we're all eating the same things over and over again. But will your food choices and your lifestyle choices honor God? Because they're either honoring God or they're not. You know, before I get into some of these foods, it's pretty amazing. I go to churches all over the world, and a lot of times I'll come in last minute, and the pastor hasn't had a chance to read my materials, and they'll take me to dinner. Now, this is not tonight. This isn't happening here. I'm just making an example. And they'll take me to a restaurant, and they've been there 20, 30 years, so everybody knows the pastor, so he goes there at this really nice restaurant, and he says, I want to order for everybody, and out comes this huge spread. Now, I want to tell you something, and I think you've heard this on this pulpit before, but God has a definition in the Bible of food and a definition of filth. It is in the Bible, look it up, in the ancient Hebrew and even in the Greek, food and filth. We just kind of mix it up a little bit. So out comes this huge spread, and I kind of look at my plate, and I say, hey, there's filth garnished with a little food, and there's some food on top of some filth stuffed with food, and the pastor says the same thing every time. I want to say grace. I want to bless the food. And first I'm thinking, bless the food. When has that ever been scripturally based? Um, I'm Jewish, by the way. I'm a Jewish believer. You kind of have to be born into the same bloodline twice. I'm a little stubborn. So I'm here, and they're going to pray over the food. Now, first of all, the Hebrew prayer that originated this praying over the food goes something like this. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. And that means, blessed are you, Lord our God, king of the universe, creator of my body, who brought forth food from the earth and blessed it before it got to my plate. Amen. That's my translation. So the, the pastor's like, Lord, bless this filth fi fi food. Turn the filth into food. Now, Jesus turned water into wine. But believe it or not, the water was probably less healthy than the wine at that time. But food turning into filths never happened, according to my knowledge. So 
On Sunday after church, a lot of people, the first thing they think about is where can we go eat? And I, Sunday is a time I just eat whatever I want, all this stuff, filth, whatever, go to the local buffet. Because either we don't know, we don't believe, or we don't care to know, or know to care, or believe to care, or care to believe. But I wonder, as we go out there, our body's a temple, we're consuming filth, I wonder, right after that lunch of filth, if we would go home, take a pornographic DVD, put it in our DVD player, and say, Lord, bless this material for the nourishment of my soul or spirit. You know what I believe, brothers and sisters, that God has either blessed or cursed things, and us praying over them doesn't do anything. What we need to pray over is ourself, that we wouldn't perish for lack of knowledge, be destroyed because we reject the knowledge. All right, so let's get started. We got a lot to cover in a short amount of time. What things are filth? Well, God had certain things to call filth back then, and some things didn't even exist that I believe are just as filthy, but let's get started. And you've heard this before, folks. Deuteronomy 14, Leviticus 11. In fact, I'm going to read a quick verse, Deuteronomy 14, starting in chapter 2, because people have this feeling that God doesn't care about what we eat, but he does. Think about it this way. Starting in verse 2, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. God's talking about how he's chosen us, not our neighbor, not maybe our friend, possibly not someone in our family. He's chosen you to hear this message. And then he goes on to spend many verses on what you should and shouldn't eat. One of the things he says not to eat is pork. You know, pork is filthy. I can give you a lot of reasons that you'd never want to eat it again scientifically. Like the fact that poor pigs will eat anything. And some people say, but what about organic pigs? I said, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> the only reason your way your pigs would be organic is if they were foot and handcuffed under 24-hour surveillance. You know what else? Pigs don't sweat. They don't eliminate toxins. Their meat spoils from the inside out. When you have healthy red meat, you see it oxidized from the outside in. A lot of them have parasites that can't be killed no matter what the heat. Now, you know, when God says that you should present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God as your spiritual act of worship. And then in Romans 12, 2, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What he's saying is, if you have the mind of Christ, you see what God sees. So I was out in a seminar in Iowa one time, and I speak extemporaneously to my fault occasionally. And I was in Iowa, and I didn't do any research on the fact that Iowa was the number one pork-raising state in the nation. <laughs> and I was speaking in an area where there were some homes that kind of were trailer homes. So here I am, and I'm referring, you know, kind of talking about the meats that you shouldn't eat, and I referred to pork as the other white trash. <laughs> now, when half the place cleaned out, I <laughs> wondered what was wrong and kind of got the picture. But I want you to understand... Some of you are just now getting it, I think. I, I want you to understand, when God calls something filth, you need to call it filth. I am so sick and tired of watching Christians celebrate what God calls filth. The world celebrates it. Think about it. Everything God says about marriage, the world says is inhibiting and ridiculous. Don't spank your children. Put them in time out with their favorite video games, and you know, as long as they agree to it, because they need to sow their wild oats. If my son disobeys, uh, he's going to sew my wild hand on his wild tushy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and even he appreciates it. But you know what? Think about it. When you go to a restaurant, they celebrate. We've got this kind of pork with this kind of lobster and this kind of catfish and shrimp. The things that God calls filth, the world celebrates. So you need to start hating what God hates and loving what God loves. Pork shouldn't be eaten. Again, I could give you lots of reasons health-wise. Shellfish, the same thing. Shellfish are great in nature because they kind of clean up after the fish droppings. If there wasn't shellfish, the oceans might be overflowing. And when you eat animal foods, you're not what you eat, you're what they ate. And here's one thing I do want you to remember when it comes to eating pork or anything like that. Biblical eating rule 101. Thou shalt not eat anything 
Jesus cast demons into. <laughs> I'll wait for that to simmer. I don't know about you, but Jesus didn't seem very wasteful. I don't think he'd waste all that food by having it go in the river and drown. Those things are detestable. You should detest them. It has nothing to do with kosher or unclean. They're detestable. You know, when it comes to eating, I love to bust myths. I want to bust such a myth right now. The myth goes something like this. In America, if you don't for breakfast consume dry cereal from a box with skim milk, you will either A, be arrested, B, die instantly, C, be attacked by a tiger named Tony, or D, be asked to walk the plank by a captain named Crunch. Do you realize that Americans believe that in the Webster's Dictionary next to cereal, it says, excuse me, next to breakfast, it says cereal and milk? Did you know the dried cereal most of you eat for breakfast is less nutritious than the box it comes in ground up? Did you know that the skim milk you drink is the main ingredient in Elmer's glue? We fall for these myths all the time, and I want to help people understand that when it comes to breakfast, no pun intended, you need to think outside the box. But here's a quick, quick story. Where did this cereal and milk come from? Over 70 years ago, a doctor, a surgeon named John Harvey Kellogg, who was a great world-renowned surgeon, decided to leave conventional medicine to practice natural healing in a retreat center called the Battle Creek Sanitarium. Dr. Kellogg treated tuberculosis, which was incurable. He treated cancer and heart disease. People came from all over. Dr. Kellogg was in Switzerland one day, and he saw the Swiss had a really interesting breakfast idea. They would take raw grains that were sun-dried, combine them with raw fruits that were sun-dried, nuts and seeds, coconut, and put them over this thick yogurt-like substance from unpasteurized milk, rich in nutrients, sprinkling the dried grains and nuts over this quark, and they called it muesli. Dr. Kellogg brought it back to America, and I believe years later, he rolls in his grave when commercials target our children, tell us to eat things that are so unhealthy. You see, I believe cereal and skim milk for breakfast at nine gets you on the road to diabetes by noon. Are you willing to do something about it? Now, by the way, on perfectweightamerica.com, your online wellness coach, I do give you resources of a couple of cereals I do recommend and all the favorite brands of foods and things that I use so you can have your shopping list printed out before you get to the store because that's where the battles really won or lost. Myth number two, red meat is bad for our health. Here's the truth. Now, while one study was done on one group of people that ate red meat, the other group that didn't, over lots and lots of years, the red meat eating group did have more cancer, heart disease, other diseases. However, the red meat eating group probably ate white flour, white sugar, artificial sweeteners, trans fatty acid rich oils. They may not have exercised and they could have been really mean people, don't you think? <laughs> My point is, why in the world would we look at red meat as the cause? Now, this group that didn't eat red meat, we know made one conscious decision, not to eat meat. Could it be that they made other decisions, like exercised, had better thoughts, whatever? The point is, the meat-eating group probably got their meat in the form of two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun with no sesame seeds because they're too healthy. Red meat can be healthy if it's natural, organic, grass-fed. It can be really healthy. Hey, and don't just think about eating beef. There's bison, like buffalo. There's lamb. And then there's a number of animals that are back in the conference room in Pastor Rod's office that I happen to see, and elk and deer, and those are healthy according to God's Word. Red meat can be healthy. In fact, many of the vitamins you buy come from red meat, like zinc for your prostate and for your skin, like B12 for energy, like B6 for your brain and metabolism, like iron for your blood, like carnosine for your immune system, carnitine for your heart, glutamine for your gastrointestinal tract, creatine for your muscles, and conjugated linoleic acid, because I like to sound smart. Is it working? Kind of iffy. 
The point is, folks, don't buy the latest myth. I was reading an interesting passage in Exodus when Moses was commanded to start the priesthood through his brother Aaron and Aaron's kids. They went on a seven-day purification ritual, like, kind of like a cleanse, but they did not drink wheatgrass juice or take colonics, which if you don't know what that is, it's an enema with a vengeance. <laughs> they did eat a special diet, though, on a seven-day purification ritual with two foods, bread without yeast and red meat. Think about it. The two foods that are not recommended in any diet in the world other than Perfect Weight America are what God said for his priests to consume. Now, this diet's great, folks. You're going to eat bread. You're going to eat red meat. You're going to even eat chocolate, and you're going to drink coffee if you want to. But it gets even better. Rice cakes and soy milk, they're out. This is real food. You're going to love what you eat. God wants you to enjoy what you do as long as it's according to him. I also want to give you a couple of tips of how you can immediately start to lose weight and feel better. Did you know that the way and order by which you eat a meal can change your health? Restaurateurs are pretty smart. They know that when you walk in to a restaurant and they can get you to eat bread, they got you. Now you think they give you bread to fill you up for their small portions, not true. They give you bread because when you eat bread before your meal, you're four times as likely, in my opinion, to order dessert because it completely throws off your meal. I recommend eating meals this way. Start with protein. The word protein comes from the Latin word proteus, which means that which comes first or of primary importance. So eat your meat, your fish, your chicken, your eggs. Second, eat your highest fiber food, usually a vegetable, a salad, greens. Then your sweetest fruit or vegetable. And then your starchiest. I bet you'll be too full to have all that bread. But people say, Jordan, can't you eat too much meat? And I answer this way. I've never known anyone to OD on salmon and broccoli. You know why? Because your brain tells you when you're full, not your stomach. You eat so many things right now that are not food that your body doesn't recognize. You don't know what's going on. I have a rule. I don't eat anything that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Jesus didn't eat. Period. Too many things we're falling prey to as experiments, and I'm going to get into some of that in a moment. Eating a meal in that particular order can be a big help to you. I also want to help you avoid something that I believe is destroying many Americans in every way. And you've heard it again before, I'm sure, but artificial or diet sweeteners in pink, blue, or yellow packets are no good. Here's why. They don't work. They're addictive, and they're dangerous. Let's start with them not working. When God created sweets, he created them to give you quick sources of energy. For example, honey is very sweet. It's got a lot of energy in very quick utilizing sugars and carbohydrates. Bananas, same thing. Juices, same thing. So when you eat something sweet, your body, which is the same body as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had thousands of years ago, says, great, I'm getting energy because I recognize the sweet taste. You can't fool your body. But you get a sweet taste, no calories. What does your body do? It goes and gets calories. Could it be that you're consuming something that says diet and it's causing you to eat more? According to research, that's the case. Because in 1987, 70 million Americans consumed artificial sweeteners. That's a lot. That's 25% or greater of America. In the year 2000, just short, 13 short years later, the number jumped to 160 million Americans consuming artificial sweeteners. And during that 13-year period, adult obesity levels went up from 15% to 30%. Don't think that artificial sweeteners weren't to blame because red meat consumption went down during that time. Sugar consumption went down, and saturated fat consumption went down. So artificial sweeteners don't work. And you know what? You didn't like them the first time you tried them anyway, be honest. You did it because it said diet. Number two, they're addictive. A doctor in my hometown, he himself and over a thousand of his patients were suffering from artificial sweetener addiction and poisoning. He said it was more difficult for them to get off these things than nicotine, 
drugs or alcohol. Some of you know someone who's consuming these things by the dozen every day. It's because they can't stop. And thirdly, they're dangerous. Now you might say, Jordan, there's no studies that prove that artificial sweeteners are dangerous. Did you know that there's only one long-term study on artificial sweeteners? And unfortunately, it's the study that you and maybe your loved ones and friends are unwittingly participating in. Do you want to wait till 10, maybe five or even three years from now when your CNN or MSNBC ticker on the bottom says groundbreaking research shows that these things were bad after all? Don't you hate that groundbreaking research? It's like, why does the ground break 10 years after mom told me it was right? Six years ago, groundbreaking research said that a diet in, rich in fruits and vegetables may improve our health. This is six years ago. Boy, am I glad I started, I started eating vegetables six years ago. Don't wait. Don't become a statistic. Artificial sweeteners are dangerous, and you're not going to find studies to prove it. But three quick examples. One, a Harvard-trained pediatrician co-authored a children's health book with me, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at age 38. Couldn't even walk. She read my book, The Maker's Diet, got off artificial sweeteners, got some vitamin D, and ate more fruits and vegetables. And today at 41, she's well with no disease. She can't prove to you, she can't prove to you that artificial sweeteners caused her disease, but she won't ever consume any again. Another friend of mine lost her husband last year at the age of 40. He was a big, muscular, 200 pound, six foot tall athletic guy who died at about 80 pounds of Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, not being able to swallow. His wife can't be sure, but she believes the 24 diet sodas he consumed a day may have had something to do with his neurological autoimmune disease. I have another friend who hosts a national TV program, and I shared this message, and he said, Jordan, I agree with you. My relative just died of cancer, weighing 65 pounds, and for 12 years, she never touched a beverage other than diet soda, and she died with a 12-pack under her bed. Believers, don't wait. I know that the pink stuff and the blue stuff and the yellow stuff is right at your snack room during work. It's right in your cupboard. It's at every restaurant, but don't go for it. Don't buy the lie. It's a chemical. It's toxic. Don't wait. Listen now. Remember, if you listen to God's voice, follow his principles, you won't get sick for I'm the Lord that heals you. That's a promise, and I encourage you to do so. The principles I go by from eating are eat what God created for food and eat food in a form that's healthy for the body. If you stick with that, you'll always go right. Eating for your perfect weight is a wonderful experience. You'll love it. Your kids will love it. I've got ice cream recipes that'll knock your socks off. My meatloaf recipe, actually my wife's, is pretty darn good. You will love the way you eat. You may spend more time in the kitchen, but I believe that's what God intended for families to do. In addition to eating for your perfect weight, I want to encourage you to drink for your perfect weight. Now, I mentioned coffee can be healthy in certain amounts. Certainly tea can be healthy, and some juices can. But there's a beverage that you are not drinking enough of that's virtually free and everywhere, and it can change your life. Of course, it's water. Now, I know you've got your water bottles, and some of you are drinking right now thinking that's going to get you out of the hot water that you're about to be in, but it's not. You see, water is amazing. I believe many of our conditions are due to chronic dehydration. If I were to ask you, what is your first sign of thirst, you're going to say it's that thing in my throat, you know, like when I'm scratchy and dry. What if I told you that the first signs of dehydration were headache, stomach ache, thick blood, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, pain in the joints, brain fog, lack of energy? What if you really don't have allergies, migraines, or ulcers? What if you're not really sick? What if you're just thirsty? I believe that water consumption is key to health, but we don't consume enough. We get tied up. We're busy. We don't, we don't know that we're not getting enough. I told my wife, Nikki, she wasn't drinking enough water. She says, sure I am. I, I really drink enough. I said, write it down for three days. She was drinking 16 ounces a day, which is not nearly enough. When she wrote it down, she did better. Remember, you don't do what's expected. You do what's inspected. Water consumption is very key. In fact, if you want to lose weight, here's a tip. Drink eight ounces of water. Repeat 
10 minutes later, every time you're about to open the fridge, pantry, or freezer, you won't eat as much. Trust me. If you've got a headache, you can do the same thing. Drink eight ounces of water, repeat 10 minutes later, and if you still remember you have a headache, reach for something healthy before a drug. Well, you might want to know how much water is recommended. Here's a good rule of thumb. Weigh yourself and divide by two. That's how many ounces of water you should drink a day. If you weigh 150 pounds, you should drink 75 ounces. If you weigh 200 pounds, you should drink 100 ounces. I weigh 190 pounds, I need 95 ounces. That is about six of those pint-sized containers. How do I drink that much in a day, you might be wondering. I start early, when I'm most dehydrated, in the morning. And I write it down and remember to do it. Now, I know what you're also thinking. Hey, if I drink that much water, I'm going to have to move my cubicle or desk near the ladies' room at work tomorrow. <laughs> First of all, if you're a guy, that's a real issue. And if you're a female, especially over the age of 45, there's really only two tips on how to consume more water. Number one, do it slowly. Don't go from 12 ounces a day to a gallon. Go slowly. And when you reach your saturation point, you're a woman over the age of 45, you're drinking more and more and more water, you might not want to laugh in public out loud for about a month. <laughs> other than that, you should be fine. But your bladder is like any other good muscle, it will adjust. Don't let that dissuade you. People say, Jordan, what kind of water is best? There's all these different opinions. I don't care what kind of water you drink, as long as it's chlorine and hopefully fluoride free. You can get it from your own purifier, from a pitcher purifier, from the store. Don't spend a lot of money on fancy water. Fizzy bubbles, pink stuff, that's not water. Water is clear, and it's clearly a good choice for your health. In addition to drinking for your perfect weight, you're going to want a snack for your perfect weight. I bet you didn't know that the Battle of the Bulge is won or lost in the field. You know how it goes. The soccer game for the kids goes late. The meeting goes too long. You didn't realize you had to stay late for work, and what do you do? Well, I'm so hungry. Vending machine, drive through people going out and bringing food in at the office. You need to get ahead of the game. And if you were in battle in the military, you would be not able to get all your meals, so they would give you these boxes of food. They're kind of dried and ready to eat. They're called MREs, Meals Ready to Eat. But I believe you're in a battle for your health. I don't think that the world wants you to be healthy. I think convenience is against you. Food companies, drug companies, hey, sometimes you get invited to your in-law's house and what they serve you, you kind of think they want you to be unhealthy too. You're in a battle for your health. How do you get prepared? You pack SREs, snacks ready to eat. SREs need only be three things, non-perishable, low in calories and high in fiber. And if you put them in your, in your computer bag, in your glove box, in your desk at work, you'll be more prepared. SREs are not designed to replace meals. They're designed to get you to your next meal safely. A great SRE is a trail mix that is homemade. Get raw nuts and seeds, or we give you a way to roast them that actually keeps them raw and highly nutritious. Get some dried fruit. That's a great SRE. There's a number of them that I recommend on our website in the resource guide. We at Garden of Life have created some great food bar SREs that you can take with you that are high in protein, high in fiber, organic, and they contain a fat-burning thermogenic nutrient. I'll talk about that in a moment. We've even created these special packets called Perfect Meal that can help you feel full for four to six hours while not giving you any junk, but making things very healthy. You need some tools. Pack SREs. That's how you snack for your perfect weight. I also want to encourage you to supplement for your perfect weight. There are three supplements I recommend on the Perfect Weight America program, but one of them is really the most exciting to me. For years, scientists have realized that people in Asia and certain cultures are healthier. They've determined that one of the reasons they're healthier is they consume seaweed, particularly brown seaweed. Now, seaweed, they thought, had minerals like iodine that really helped your metabolism. And that was why seaweed was good, but wasn't so. Then they thought it was the polysaccharides or fiber, but it turns out that's not the case. But in 1995, brown seaweed, which by the way is a stuff that floats in the ocean, but it isn't burned, 
It runs on photosynthesis, but it doesn't have roots. Sea vegetables contribute 70% of our nation's oxygen, or world's oxygen, but we don't like to eat them here in America. But in 1995, scientists discovered a carotenoid, like a pigment, similar to beta-carotene, lycopene, and lutein. And it's called fucoxanthin. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you a quiz on how to spell it or even say it. But fucoxanthin is a carotenoid like lutein, lycopene, beta-carotene. And most carotenoids are specific to an organ or system. Lutein is good for the macula of the eyes, beta-carotene for the immune system, lycopene for the prostate. But fucoxanthin is specific for fat. Amazing. And in fact, an article in 2006 said that laboratory animals that ate fucoxanthin lost 10% of their body weight which is about what most Americans need to lose. But at the end of the article, it said that fucoxanthin would not be available in a drug or a supplement until 2011 or five years. Fortunately, my good friend and Russian scientist, Dr. Ramazanov, had just figured out how to concentrate fucoxanthin and put it in capsule form. But before I was interested in looking at it, I wanted to see the research. And there were three studies done. One study on fucoxanthin tested women with their, that were overweight or obese and their resting metabolic rate. Your resting metabolic rate is how many calories you burn while you sit there and pretty much do nothing. So for example, you're sitting there next to that lovely young lady and one of you burns more calories than the other. It's just different for each of us. Obviously, the more calories you burn, the better. Hey, I go out every day and tell people to eat healthy, and they listen occasionally. I tell people to exercise, and sometimes they do. But if I could tell Americans to sit there and do nothing, I'd get 100% compliance. <laughs> Be a good thing to improve that resting metabolic rate. Those that took fucoxanthin had an 18.2% greater resting metabolic rate than those that didn't. Now I was getting excited. But you know what happens with kind of weight loss supplements or fat burners? They seem to cause jitters, lost sleep, somebody dies. It's a disaster, and I never was interested in that. So I wanted to see how this worked. Well, fucoxanthin works uniquely, not on the central nervous system, doesn't raise your heart rate, cause jitters. It actually works within the fat cells to cause something called intracellular thermogenesis. That's a fancy way to say inside the cells generating heat or burning fuel, and your fat is the fuel. But I wanted to see more, and in a double-blind placebo-controlled study, 151 overweight and obese women were broken up into two groups. One took fucoxanthin, one didn't. They ate the same exact food. The fucoxanthin group lost 14 and a half pounds in 16 weeks. The other group lost three. Now, I want to explain something to you. That's a 383% increase in weight loss. And about a year ago, the first pharmaceutical was on the market for weight loss, it was over the counter. And it said if you took it, you could lose 50% more weight than diet alone. But there were a few side effects, like the first few weeks or months of taking it, you kind of maybe should bring dark pants to work and a change of clothes, if you know what I mean. Now, granted, those side effects did not stop people from swarming the stores because we're desperate to lose weight. Now we found something that helps boost your metabolism without side effects. And I wanted to look into the research. What is it doing to the heart? And I found that instead of increasing your blood pressure, it supported your blood pressure and decreased it. Instead of increasing triglycerides, decrease. And instead of increasing inflammation, it decreased it. Here we have a powerful antioxidant that also helps you burn fat, and it does it to a specific type of fat that is mostly in your abdomen that I believe is causing so many of our problems. Do you know one of the greatest risk factors for disease for you and your family is not a fancy blood test, but it's your measurement around your waist. And I believe if you're an adult and your waist is much more in inches than half your height, you're at risk of cardiovascular disease. Let me repeat that. If your waist in inches is greater than half your height. So I am almost 73 inches. I need a 36 and a half inch waist. Think about that for yourself. That gut just doesn't look unsightly. It can be a major contributor to disease. And God wants you here for a reason. Fucoxanthin is a great tool 
to help you win the Battle of the Bulge. It's safe, it's effective, and I have a feeling you'll be hearing a lot more about it. Supplements don't make the difference in your health, but they can contribute to positive wellness if you know the right ones to use. In addition to changing your diet, I want to encourage you to change your life. And I'm going to breeze through these because I'm running out of time. Number one, I want you to cleanse for your perfect weight. Now, cleansing is a misunderstood topic because most people think in order to cleanse, you've got to drink lemon juice and cayenne pepper for 40 days. Then there's those people who think you need to drink grapefruit juice for four days, olive oil, eight ounces straight, and maybe lay on your left side and wake up and hope green pellets come out. Now, I don't know about you. Every night I go to sleep, I really wish that none of that would happen. We cleanse in these crazy ways. We, we, we eat this, you know, one food or one juice. We've created a great cleanse called the perfect cleanse. It's a diet and a system. And not only are you going to be eating five times a day to help reduce toxins or get rid of them, you're going to be enjoying what you eat, and we're going to help you for the first time learn to cleanse for the seasons. You know, we know that raw fruits and juices are cleansing, but in the cold winter, they can actually cause more harm than good. I've created a cleansing chicken soup that, believe it or not, cleanses you just as good as watermelon would in the summer in the winter. And on your Perfect Weight America online wellness coach, you will be encouraged to cleanse every quarter for 10 days. January. April is a great time. July and October. Hey, if you want to lose weight fast, people say, what's the best way to do it? Go on a cleanse. The perfect cleanse will help you lose weight. I lost eight pounds in January on my cleanse. Didn't really need to lose much. My colleague lost 12. I was at a church in Tulsa. The pastor heard this message. I saw him two weeks later in Louisiana. He said, hey, Jordan, it's Pastor Gary, 10 pounds lighter. Really does make a difference. Cleansing for your perfect weight can help you bust through plateaus, get rid of some stored toxins, and it's really more of a jump start to reaching your wellness goals. But in addition to cleansing for your perfect weight, I want you to get fit for your perfect weight. And I'm going to introduce you in your online program to a fitness system that does not involve a gym membership, because you may not go, does not involve expensive home equipment, because let's face it, you're going to hang semi-dry clothing on it after the first week and not see it anymore. And it doesn't involve wearing spandex, and everybody said? Amen. It's not difficult, but it's so important. We just don't exercise. Hey, if you want to be extraordinary in your health, separate yourself from the pack. Only 11% of the nation exercises. Be one of those 11%. We're going to teach you how to train movements, not muscles, because it's functional. Run in short bursts of exertion, because it's interval. And training, because, well, it'll be a little bit of work. Functional interval training is fit. And you're going to learn in your online wellness program that what you know to be cardio exercise may not even be that good for your heart. You're going to learn that it doesn't really take expensive or fancy equipment to get in the best shape of your life. And you're also going to learn that the complaints we have about everything dropping on, on our body, it's not just the outside, it's the inside also. We need to exercise not just for looks, but for health, integrity of our muscles and joints and tendons and ligaments. We're going to give you a great program. You won't have to run long distances because I actually believe that's unhealthy. After all, Marathon, which is something we celebrate, was named after a guy who ran in ancient Greece to declare victory in the War of Marathon, ran 26.2 miles and dropped dead after he reached his destination. And today we celebrate marathon running because why? We probably just like to do things backwards. Hey, if I were to ask you, would you rather look like a marathon runner or a sprinter, what would you tell me? Well, let's examine the facts. Marathon runners are very thin, emaciated even. They look older than they are. They're always sick, and those short shorts are not helping anybody. <laughs> Sprinters are muscular and strong. They look like the David statue. They, they look like Roman gladiators because we were meant to move fast and then rest. Now, fit can be accomplished on a treadmill, on a bike, on an elliptical. You can do it on a mini trampoline or just outside. And it's easy, and you'll love it. Give it a chance. But even more importantly than getting fit for your perfect weight is reducing toxins for your perfect weight. I don't have a lot of time to share about this, but there's four areas we focus on. Now, mind you, toxins don't make you fat, but 
toxins store in your fat cells. And unfortunately, in America, we've got a lot of storage space, don't we? These toxins don't kill you overnight, but years and years of accumulation can cause problems. Four areas you need to be aware of. What you eat. Now, that involves whether you eat organic, local, or just conventional foods. People say, but Jordan, I can't afford all organic. Are there some that are more important than others? Absolutely. Since toxins store in fat, the fattiest food should be organic. The general rule is buy animal foods like meat, poultry, eggs, and dairy organically, and with vegetable foods, we'll give you ways to reduce some of the surface toxins to make them less toxic. If you can afford to buy all organic, great. It's just not practical for everybody. The second area is water. Now, you should be drinking purified water, but did you know that the shower you take for 15 minutes on warm gives you a thousand times increase in chlorine, which is a toxin? What do you do about that? We give you the name of a company or local stores that can sell you a cheap shower head that you can screw off your current one, put this filter right on, and it lasts a year, and you're reducing a major toxin in your health. Number three, air quality. Hey, outdoor air is not great, but indoor air can be 500 times more toxic. We give you so many simple tips like opening windows, getting house plants, natural, not synthetic, of course. They can actually purify the air. Or you can get air purification systems. Some are as small as plug-ins, and I've got one in my hotel room and on our bus and eight in my home. If you really need it, it's worth it. The, the fourth area of reducing toxins, many of you aren't going to like this one, is what you put on your skin, hair, nails, and brush your teeth with. I want to quickly say this. If you're not willing to eat what you put on your skin, hair, nails, or brush your teeth with, then you shouldn't do it. Your skin is a giant, eliminative organ that goes two ways. And guess what? We put baby shampoo on our kids that have every single ingredient unpronounceable and chemical. But, but it's gentle on the eyes, Jordan. Yes, because it numbs the tear ducts of our one-year-old. They can't handle toxins the way we can. Hey, what about toothpaste? Well, we're told to brush our teeth all the time, and it's red, white, and blue striped, right? It's, it's, it's American. Well, those red, white, and blue stripes don't come from strawberries, blueberries, and coconuts, folks. And the fine print on your toothpaste says if you accidentally swallow, call the poison control center. So here's kind of the, the way it goes. Hey, Tommy, you go brush your teeth and be a good boy, and I'll call poison control. We need to wake up, folks. Each and every day you choose to live or you choose to die, and this is a big area. Don't wait till 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now and find out you've got a lot of toxins. You know, when people come to me and say, I've got six months to live, or my cousin's dying, or you've got to help my uncle, you know what I wish I could say? I wish I could say to them, hey, 30 years ago, if you could just eat, hey, 20 years ago, if you could just drink, man, 10 years ago, if you could just avoid, I don't get that chance, but I do today. Remember, if you, if you heed the voice of the Lord your God, it, it, test this, pray about this, don't just take my word for it. If God's speaking to you and you listen, he'll heal you before you have symptoms. Folks, even more importantly than reducing toxins is to think for your perfect weight. I've been around the nation, and I've learned and seen the principles that I hold dear come alive in people. We've adopted eight families on the Perfect Weight America Tour, helping them improve their health. We've adopted a school where they got rid of their junk food in their vending machines and put water instead of sodas. We're not working on the five meals they get in the school first. We're teaching the teachers and the parents how to prepare 16 good ones at home because the ones at school will follow. We want to have this school be the world's healthiest school and prove it with grades and behavior. And a research study at a university is being done about this. It's a passion of mine. But what I've learned on this tour from adopting these families that I really knew from God's word is that you're not just what you eat, you're what you think. And there's three areas that I help people deal with. And this is people that are secular because God's principles always work, even if you don't give glory to the one who created them. We deal with stress, and we have exercises in the online program that you're going to get for free to help you. We deal with self-hatred. We have such an issue with this, folks. And we deal with unforgiveness. And unforgiveness that's turned to bitterness is destroying 
our health. It's like carrying around a 100-pound weight vest. It's like cancer that's multiplying more rapidly than any malignancy could. And if you carry around unforgiveness and it turns to bitterness, it's like drinking poison and expecting it to kill the other person. We have seen miracles happen through forgiveness. And I know you believe it, but Christians are watching as their marriages are deteriorated. Your relationships, your intimate relationships, having walls put between them, and your success in health, losing weight, overcoming fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, cancer, is almost always linked to a traumatic or tragic experience that may not have been your fault, or it was your fault, and you will not forgive yourself. Some of you need to forgive people that have hurt you and done inexplainable, illegal things to you. Some need to forgive yourself. I see it every day. And others need to forgive God because you think that he blesses everyone else but you. And they're all less righteous, by the way. Right? If you forgive and follow the exercises that we have in our program, they're simple. It's like an emotional or spiritual detox. It's so important. The first family we adopted was in Seattle. Their names, Kim and Derek Keyes. Kim walked in to our discussion, 31 years of age, perfectly healthy and thin. Her husband, Derek, walked in, 34 years of age, 600 pounds. You know, I don't know what it's like to be obese, but I know what it's like to be just, you know, ugly and, and have people look at me funny and not want to be around me. But I learned from Derek a little bit about what he goes through. And I said, Derek, what's the earliest memory you have of being overweight or different? He immediately said, I remember the day my doctor told my mother that I was fat and I was always going to be fat. I was four years old. The doctor said, your son, ma'am, will weigh 300 pounds. And Derek said, I vowed to never weigh 300 pounds. And I hate that doctor for saying it. Derek kept his promise as we have a way of doing. Because when he graduated high school, he weighed 400 pounds. When he got his college diploma, 500 pounds, 510 pounds when he got lap band surgery, and over 600 pounds when he completed graduate school for psychology. He went on to talk about how every day he leaves the correctional facility he works at to the taunting of inmates, laughing, reminiscent of Fat Albert. He talks about how when he walks around with his thin wife. He knows that people are looking and wondering why she's married to him. He feels like her parents may feel the same way and occasionally wonders if she doesn't wish that their wedding picture had next to her a thin, different guy. Derek went on to say that he only sleeps in his bedroom once a week. It's on the second floor and walking is too difficult and crawling hurts his knees too bad. He also talked about the time he went on a ride at a fair. They pulled the lever to get it moving, and it stopped, and he had to get off in front of the shame of his friends and family, and he had tears flowing down his face. And it was time for me now to play psychologist, and I said, Kim, tell Derek all the reasons you love him. And she said, Derek is warm and compassionate, sensible. He's loving. The greatest guy I know. But what I love most about my husband is every day he comes home from work, the garage door goes up at 7, and my adopted daughter and two foster kids run to the door and say, Daddy, Daddy, we love you. We missed you. Tears rolled down Kim's cheek as she said, I dread for the day that that garage door doesn't go up. Derek's a walking time bomb. We're going to do anything we can to help him. Are you going to wait? Until it's too late, are you going to hearken diligently to the word of the Lord your God? And avoid or even allow God to heal these diseases. Do spiritual surgery on your health. Think for your perfect weight. Being just about out of time, I have to share with you three principles on how you can change your world. Because I believe if you change your diet and change your life, you can have extraordinary health. But it's only worth anything if you can change your world. And the first way to do it is environmental sustainability. Now listen, if I were to write a book about environmentalism, it would be The Green Movement, Confessions of a Non-Tree Hugger. I mean, I I've never really thought much about the environment. Let's face it, politically, I don't agree with the people that talk about green. I don't really know if climate change or global warming is 
is correct. In fact, I don't really think it is, but you know what I do know? Our environment is 400 times more toxic than three generations ago. My organization, Garden of Life, two years ago decided to use wind power for our offices and our warehouse. We print on recycled paper. We use soy-based ink because I don't believe we should eat that much soy. We got to do something with it. We use full-spectrum lighting. We recycle. We try to eat local and organic. Don't waste a lot of things. And, you know, somebody came up with a great idea that our restrooms at our office would be on automatic timers, the lights, so they'd shut off every 30 seconds. Well, what I like to tell our employees is when you're on perfect cleanse, make sure to bring a flashlight to work. We're making small changes, and we're going to give you 20 ways that you can improve your environment. Think about it this way. God made us stewards over our, our environment. It is only going to be the product of our actions. We need to either be part of the solution or we're definitely part of the problem. But way more importantly than environmental sustainability is to sustain life. And you do that by raising a healthy generation after you. Proverbs 22.6 says, train or start a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. The Lord tells us not to be proud. I am proud of one thing in life, and it is the way that I've been able to start my children in their health, emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. You know, I don't have great genetics. I was ill. My father has health problems. My grandmother had health problems. It only got worse, but I determined that my son Joshua would be healthy if I had anything to say about it. I believe what the devil meant for bad in my life, God's going to mean for good in Joshua's life and his future generations. And we've had to work at it, my wife Nikki and I. But over the last six months, we've had the privilege of adopting two infants, an eight-month-old and a five-month-old. We didn't know we'd get twins, but we did. People say, Jordan, you're on the, the road for an entire year and you've got two babies? What's the deal with that? And I say, look, I don't like changing diapers. That's a bad joke. The truth of the matter is that you learn from adoption what changing one life can do. And adoption stories are not fun. One of my children has a mother who is sexually abused by men and women. The other has a mother who was 16 when she had the child and referred to the child as it as well as the pregnancy, but fortunately she gave the baby up. One father abused cocaine, the other father is in prison in the psych ward with bipolar disorder, illiterate, finished fifth grade, and has been abusing drugs since he was 10. I don't know what their genetics are, but guess what? I've determined to do whatever I can to keep them healthy. I spend a day and a half or two days a week at home. Three hours of it is making an infant formula from scratch. Somebody said, but Jordan, don't you want to relax? Don't you want to rest? I say, you know what? Three weeks ago, I was making this infant formula when we got our second child, Samuel, and I said, I'm gonna thank God every five minutes I'm doing this, and I get tired, and I can barely keep my eyes open. Sometimes it's 1 a.m., but I don't know a single father out there that can say they've made every bit of nourishment that their five-month-old daughter has consumed. There's nothing more important to me than giving my children that start. You know, it is hard to feed your kids healthfully. Some of you say, but Jordan, my kids won't eat anything but, usually that blank right there is chicken nuggets. It's the number one food for kids in America. We have a vice president at our company that came from Arby's, and he, along with many fast food executives, fought mandatory labeling and nutritional facts for fast food. They were outraged that the government wanted chicken nuggets to contain at least 80% chicken. When you see an ad for chicken nuggets and it says, now with real chicken, does that scare you at all? <laughs> it's really gotten bad with our kids' health. 19,000 images of junk food is played during cartoon time. That's why your kids are buying things or grabbing things when you're shopping. I took my son when he was two years old to his first birthday party. The girl turned three. She was in his preschool class. The lunch menu was pepperoni pizza, potato chips in a juice box with 10% real juice, the other 90%, who knows. Two types of candy that were colored, one with chocolate and one with fruit flavor inside, were hands distance from these kids. 
We didn't know what we were going to feed Joshua. Fortunately, there were some fruit brought for the adults that was left untouched, of course. We gave some fruit to Joshua, and we were on our way. But not before we got a gift bag with nine different types of candy in it. Well, they want to get you on the way in and out, don't they? And the candy was all different kinds of crazy types that are much more ingenious than when I was a kid. You can wear it as a necklace. You can put it in your mouth and look like Dracula teeth, but it's really candy. We dumped the candy and took the little bag it came in. And as we walked out, I looked at the coat rack and I saw the girl whose birthday it was, mother's lab coat that said, Dr. So-and-so, pediatrician. You want to know why we're unhealthy? Go to a birthday party. You know, the next day, I had planned to take my son to the zoo, and we went to the local zoo, and when we got there, they said, baby monkey exhibit, and the people at the desk were real excited. They said, you'll never get this chance again. They're brand new babies, and they only come out in the morning. You need to go there, so my son Joshua and I ran over there. When I got there, there was this fence, and on it was a sign that said, these monkeys are cute. Don't feed the monkeys. Your food makes them sick thought, your food, that's it. I'll put a sign on Joshua's back when he goes out in public. (laughs) Joshua is cute. Don't feed Joshua. Your food makes him sick. (laughs) Hey, folks, if you train a child in the way that they should go when they're old, and even when they're young, they won't depart from it. I was praying with my son at night, and I said, Joshua, would you like me to pray for anything special? And he said, Daddy, I want you to pray for for Jake and the other kids at school that they wouldn't eat all that junky stuff. He knows how important it is. And you know, you're sitting here today and you might say, Jordan, I don't have kids that are young. My kids are out of the house. I've got grandkids. You know, what can I do? Well, first of all, you might be here and you don't have kids yet. Praise God, you're going to be able to raise them healthfully. But if you do have kids, start not just by saying they should eat healthy, start by living it When someone tells me they want their kids to eat healthy, but they won't, I say, what do you eat around them? And then they change the subject. Wow, Columbus is sure cold today. 32 is the low. (laughs) Kids don't do what we say, parents. They do what we do. And hey, if you're a grandmother and you're here thinking, you know, Jordan, my my daughter-in-law feeds my grandkids terribly. Is there any tactful way that I could get her to feed them healthfully? There's no tactful way to do it. (laughs) I can tell you that much. But you know what? We have this terrible saying, let's spoil our grandkids rotten. How about you treat your grandkids healthy when they come to the house? You can make a difference, folks. There's nothing more important than our future generations. Start today. Make it a family affair. You will love the food, I promise. You'll love the principles. And there's nothing more important than your children and your family being healthy. If my child is sick for an hour, It just breaks my heart. I was sick and watched my parents and my grandparents just die on the inside. You can do this, folks. You can be the parents of the first generation that was healthier than the last instead of less healthy. But more importantly than anything I've talked about today of how to change your world is to choose life. And choosing life to me is all wrapped up in one word and it's purpose. We've heard a lot about purpose over the last few years, but I believe purpose is just two words, experience shared, experience shared. You know, you might be going through something right now in your finances, in your health, with your children, in your relationships, in your marriage. Don't think of it as something that God's putting you through. Think of it as something you're going through so you can share the triumphant results with somebody else. That's all experience is. You know, even tonight, You're coming here, you're hearing a message, and I guarantee you, you've learned something that someone you know could benefit from. When I do my seminars across the country, I always hear somebody say, Jordan, I'm here because someone gave me your book. I'm well now. But think about it, the person that gave them the book didn't write it, they may not have been a doctor, they might not have been able to speak in front of large crowds, they may not have been, you know, a scholar. They were just one thing, willing. Are you willing to live the message, and are you willing to share a message? Every truth that you hear needs to be shared. To whom much is given, much is required. When you learn something that's truth, you have to share it. Live it first, then share it. You know, so many times I see people everywhere, 
They just are waiting. Jordan, as soon as I lose that 50 pounds, I'll share the message. As soon as I'm perfect, as soon as I get to the destination, but we never reach it. While you're on the journey, give your fellow brothers and sisters the opportunity to get this information as well. I believe that if you share a message of health and hope with people, if you live a message, you may not realize this side of heaven, the impact you've had, or even that you already begun to sow. If each person in this room went to perfectwaytamerica.com and got on with your wellness coach, your own personal wellness coach, and you told one person a month about this program, and you, it could be free for them as well, go ahead. The math would say that if you told 12 people and they told 12 people that in a year America would be well, and in two years the world would be healthy. The question is, are you willing to do it? You've listened, are you willing to act? You know, let me close with this passage of scripture. It comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Actually, I'm gonna do my version. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 30 is a great chapter of the Bible. Moses, who read the entire law, 613 commandments to the Israelites, many of them had not heard it before because they were coming out of the 40 years and into the promised land. They must have been freaked out. Could you imagine sitting there for 613 laws by a 128-year-old man? They were overwhelmed. But here's what Moses said to them, and I'm going to say this to you after you've heard just a little information, and I'm sure your mind's going, i got to throw this away, that away. What am I going to do at work? How am I going to eat at school? Here's what God has to say. These commandments and truths, starting in verse 11, these commandments and truths I'm giving you are not too difficult or mysterious for you. They're not far off. You don't need to send someone up into heaven to find them for you and bring them to you so you may follow them. They're not under the deepest sea that you need to send a diver down to go get them and find them and bring them to you so that you may follow them. No. These commandments are near you, says the Lord. They're in your heart and in your mouth. And for some of you, they're in that Bible that you only take off your shelf one day a week. And then the very popular passage where the Lord says, See, I'm holding heaven and earth as witnesses against you. That means whether you like it or not, understand it or not, that Bible you're holding, those laws you've heard, you're accountable for. Heaven and earth as witnesses against you. And you've got choices. The same tonight as the Israelites had thousands of years ago. Two choices. You've got life or death. You've got blessings or cursings, but choose life that you may live and that you may dwell in the land that your forefathers were given and your future generations can enjoy as an inheritance. Good health is an inheritance. It's promised from God, long and abundant life. With long and abundant life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Do you wanna live as long as God intends? Do you wanna live as well as God intends? Do you want to stand up like Daniel and say, I am not going to eat that junk that the best of the best of the experts are telling me to eat, but I'm going to stand up and live for God. Daniel changed his world. He was a prisoner. He was in bondage. And your biggest excuse is that you passed three fast food restaurants on the way to work and didn't have time for breakfast. Daniel was 16 years old. He was in bondage. He would rather die than break God's commandment. And Daniel in his lifetime not only saw every king turn and proclaim that God was God, but Daniel gave a message that was later added to by John that gives us a hope for a future to spend eternity at a marriage supper of the Lamb that will be the greatest and healthiest meal in history. My question to you is, are you going to allow God to do everything he wants to do in and through you before you reach that supper? Because if you are, it starts with taking care of this temple that God says is holy. 
God says that you were bought with a price, therefore honor him with your body and your spirit. You know what, folks? God doesn't come to earth physically today, nor does he send angels to preach the good news. But for some strange reason, he chose me and he chose you. And your physical body is all you have to carry around the spirit of God that within this body, this temple, life and death, blessings and cursings. And today, World Harvest, I would love to see you choose life. When you leave this congregation, you're gonna make a choice. You're gonna do something, or you're gonna wait to hear it again, or you're gonna wait till something happens. Choose life. Folks, I'm gonna pray for you, but before I do, I just wanna mention one thing. Pastor wanted us to bring some tangible tools for you. We've created something called the Ultimate Success Kit. Statistics say that when people hear a message, they decide to act now, or most likely they don't. And at every foyer, we have this Ultimate Success System. What we have is the Perfect Way to America experience, much of what I shared tonight and more in DVD and CD. We've got a functional interval training fitness DVD that'll help you exercise along with myself. No gym equipment required. You've got the book, Perfect Weight America, and the online program that you all are gonna get for free. Don't forget, perfectweightamerica.com. You've got a journal, because people don't do what's expected, they do what's inspected. You've got Perfect Cleanse, which is the cleanse system I talked about. You've got our Fucoxanthin product, the fat-burning miracle from the sea. You've got some of those snacks ready to eat to help you get to your next meal to safety. Tonight we have some special prices out at every foyer. Well, we don't have them with us, we'll take your order, and a large portion of the proceeds are gonna go to World Harvest Church to build this temple while you're building your temples. But before we close, I wanna pray for you, and I want you all to stand if you would. Now while I'm praying, I want to encourage you to make a decision to choose life and as I'm praying, I want you to also lift up the people in your life that aren't here tonight, that are suffering from diseases and health challenges. And I want you to pray two things as I'm gonna pray. That A, God would heal them instantaneously because it's what we all want and God is capable. But if he chooses not to, I wanna encourage you to pray that you would speak to them with just one principle you've learned and tell them that there is a better way, there is God's way. Don't just give God your spirit. Don't just sing that hymn, I surrender all except breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> give God everything. He created you, he loves you, he wants you to be well. His name means salvation, and salvation is alive and it lives in you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The mirror doesn't always tell us that. We don't always feel like we're in your image, Lord, but I know and we confess that we are created in your image. Ambassadors, Lord God, of you. I pray, Father, right now in Jesus' name that this congregation would take hold of your principles and choose life so that one day it would be said in the largest newspaper in this town and in this state that World Harvest Church has the healthiest people in Ohio. And it's all because they serve a mighty God. Lord, I pray right now that diseases like cancer and heart disease and diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, childhood diseases, skin disorders, Lord God, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, arthritis, autoimmune diseases like lupus, multiple sclerosis would be healed in Jesus' name. Lord God, we believe that you spoke your word and healed us. But Father, we want to hearken diligently to the voice of you. And if you want us to get well through principles, Lord, give us the wisdom. Convict us to give up the very last thing that we're holding on to that you want to transform. Lord God, I know that if we change our diets and change our lives, that you can use us to change our world. Father, I pray right now for the people in this room and for the loved ones that you're gonna bring to their mind right now 
that those individuals would be healed, Lord God. We speak the blood of Jesus over them, Father, that takes away their sins and their sicknesses. And Lord, we also pray that the people in this room, that we would be courageous enough, even if we don't know everything that was said today, even if we don't know your entire health plan, we may not be doctors, we may not be experts, but we can be willing to share. I pray, Lord God, that we would step out in faith and share this message of truth with those we love most. Doesn't matter if they laugh at us, Lord God. What matters is that somebody we tell is gonna have a life change Somebody we tell that doesn't know you, Lord, is going to have a life change. And they're going to come back to us and say, you changed my life. And you're going to say, it wasn't me. There's a physician I'm going to introduce you to. It's the great physician. And this great physician has no waiting list. He's not booked up. In fact, he is ready right now to meet you. And if you think your physical health improved, wait till you see what God can do with your life. Lord God, I pray for the staff at this church, for the Parsley family, for everyone in this church, this school, Lord God, this college that you want to use to raise up an army, Lord. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Lord, we pray that we would raise up a healthy harvest, that this wouldn't just be a message, Lord God, but this would be a movement, that it would be ingrained in every aspect of this ministry, that the world would marvel, Lord God, that we would not become healthy, Father, by power and not by might, but by your spirit convicting our lives and that we would begin, Lord God, to choose life right now. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord God. We thank you, Father, that you heal all our diseases, that you restore health unto us and heal our wounds. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah, who was and is and is one day soon to come. In Jesus' name, we pray healing. In Jesus' name, we pray favor. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.